Welcome back to the Marvel Movie Minute, a daily podcast in which we explore the films of the Marvel Cinematic Universe one minute at a time. In this, our fourth season, we're looking at Kenneth Branagh's 2011 film, Thor. I'm Matthew from TheEthicalPanda.com. And I'm Andy Nelson from The Next Real Film Podcast. And today we're talking about Minute 53, which begins with Jane hoping for Thor's sanity and ends with Loki and his mother talking at Odin's hospital bed. Joining us today is all this week is Scott Corelli, founder of Dueling Genre Podcast Network and host of Franchiseography. Scott, so were you a comic book guy? Were you just, did you just kind of get into the MCU with Spider-Man? Like what, what's kind of your connection to comics and movies and uh, um, MCU stuff? Uh, I mean, I've read comics my whole life. Uh, I think, um, I, you know, I, because my dad collected comics and so I read all of his growing up. And then I think the first comic I ever bought myself was probably Death of Superman, most likely. And, uh, and yeah, and then I, I, I read comics a lot when I was like, when I was a kid and I dropped out you know, somewhere in like middle school, high school area. And then right after high school, um, I wandered into a comic shop and uh, heard that Spider-Man was in a cocoon for some reason. And I was like, well, I <laughs> need to learn more about whatever this is. Um, and then I've been reading comics ever since. And so, uh, yeah, I'm definitely a Wednesday warrior. And was Thor a character who was on your radar screen at all before these movies came out? Uh, I had read the JMS run. Um, I had read uh, some of the older stuff, uh, but it wasn't, I had never, there was no Thor run that I was like head over heels with Mm -hmm. um, really uh, until after this. I love the Jason Aaron run to pieces. Um, and the the current run is also uh, really really excellent, but uh, yeah, not not really. So I was kind of going into this movie with my arms crossed a little because I was like, all right, I don't yeah. really like Thor that much. So you really <laughs> got to impress me to make me care about this guy. And uh, and I felt the same way about Captain America. So back to back this summer, I was just like, I don't know, you guys, I don't know if this is going to work. And I, I really love this one. And then I love the first Avenger. Um, so, uh, yeah, I was really, I was, a, I was a very happy comics fan that summer. Awesome. Well, we'll get to hear more of your thoughts on this minute in just one moment. Have you ever heard of Patreon? Well, like so many podcasters out there, we are fans of their site, and we find it to be just a great platform for all of our fans to support us by becoming patrons. Well, we have now upgraded our site to Patreon's memberful platform, which allows us to actually build our patron support platform right into our own site. So if you've been thinking about becoming a patron to show your love for the show, but you weren't sure about it as you can't find us on Patreon, just know that we are, in fact, using their platform. You can learn more about it at memberful.com. They make it so, so easy. Just visit truestory.fm slash Marvel Movie Minute, and you can find out what we offer to our patrons. It's only $5 a month, and you can even get a discount if you join at the annual rate. Thanks. So we get, you know, Thor finishing that sentence about the rainbow and just this wonderful moment from Jane where she just kind of looks at him for a second and then looks back to the road and God, I hope you're not crazy. What, what's going on with her in that moment, you think? I mean, it's it's funny because, you know, she's being so scientific and Einstein Rosenbridge and he's saying more like a rainbow bridge. It's like and he's so like serious about it. And that's why it's and, and he's charming. And that's I think there's this incredible ease with which chris hemsworth delivers lines like this that are so funny but like he really seems like somebody who just buys into everything that that goes along with asgard and so when he's delivering lines like more like a rainbow bridge it just is like so perfect and it fits and i can see why she's like like she's she's you know just little puppy dog eyes looking at him but she's like god i hope you're not crazy because i want you i mean that's really like what what she's saying right here i i actually read it as you know we were talking about in yesterday's minute about um the fact that she's kind of lost all of her research because she took it all and now i you know i think that she's going on this run with Thor because she's like, you're my only shot to like have anything to show for the years of research that I put into this thing. So, 
Um, let's go and do this thing. And like, maybe you can help me get my research back and then you can get your hammer thing or whatever it is you're wanting to do. And then he says this thing of like, like, oh, like a rainbow bridge. And then she's just like, oh my God, I hope you're not crazy. Because like, <laughs> if he is, then she's just breaking into a government facility for no reason. Right. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I'm more on that, though. I think it's probably some of both. Some of it is the like, you know, she doesn't want to think that the one guy she's met is, you know, who's not a jerk is also because he's off his rocker. And but also I think that's that. Yeah, it's the kind of like she's now thinking about like dragging him in front of Culver University, like research publishing boards, you know, and like if she brings someone and like, here's the basis of my research and they kick his they figure out he's just a quack like she's her <laughs> academic career is over. So like, yeah, I think it's all that wrapped up. And and to me, it was also kind of a it, it's a nice moment that I think also really works for the scene because. One, we were talking before about how romances can go bad, and I think one of the things that can often happen, and this is kind of a misogynistic trope, is the woman who is supposed to be this great scientist, and she knows all of this stuff, and she's so smart and powerful, but she just goes utterly to pieces when a cute man smiles at her. And what I kind of what I kind of got out of this is, yeah, she just had that moment of like you know connection with him and flirtation, but now she's back to the science. Now she's like, okay, now we're talking about the bridge and. Like today, it's funny that I mean, this movie wasn't made that long ago, but in terms of how much how much the romances in these movies have changed, I think a lot has, is done. And at the time this movie came out, for her to be the character who does keep pulling back to her research and her science instead of just, you know, being all into him, it, it was a nice change. Yeah, certainly. So then we have them kind of driving off into the sunset, and there's this great shot with a cloud in the top left and the kind of hills or the New Mexico mountains are in front of them. Well, and just as far as the sunset goes, it's like, this is where I get, you know, and I know it's a film, they have to figure out how to like move from one time to another, you know, as far as, you know, exterior day to exterior dusk to exterior night. But it's like, (laughs) they were just in town, and it was a bright, sunny day. And the crater we know is 50 miles west of town. That's like, you know, maybe an hour on the dirt roads. And now they're like, it's, it's the sunset. And, uh, you know, soon it will be much past that. And so I, I part of my brain struggles with the, the time here, although it is a gorgeous New Mexico sunset. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it reminds me of uh, of like a Chloe Zhao shot, actually, because, um, uh, you know, all of her movies have uh, very similar kind of shots of like following something on sort of a like a parallel line um, where like, but everything is like at dusk at that, like sort of golden hour. Um, You can see a lot of shots like that in the Eternals uh, marketing stuff. I'm sure everyone has already seen Eternals at the, by the time they're (laughs) listening listening to this, Uh, but I have not yet. Um, But uh, yeah, that's what that, it it reminds me of that. And so it just immediately made me think of Chloe Zhao. Yeah, I can see that. And I I certainly, when we're going to get to the next couple of minutes where it's just, night uh i have some questions about how much time they spent driving although as someone who has driven some some dirt road driving um you know you're not going 50 miles an hour on those roads and so depending on how much of it's dirt maybe eh, we can squeeze the head cannon around there but it's a little eyebrow raising um but then of course so we kind of cut away from that we cut to odin's bedside and i thought it was interesting the first shot really hit me you know we get this great shot of this epic bed he's on and kind of this golden shield dust thing around him but what i really noticed was that loki and frigga his mother uh loki's mother they look so small like in that shot just they were so far away and i thought that was just a very interesting way of setting the scene it is and they're so still too i mean it's almost designed as if it's a painting right like or a comic book frame really where you have this immense bed that's glowing golden and they're both almost mirror images of each other on opposite sides of it just sitting there looking at him it's i mean it's a it's a powerful image to come in on with this scene well especially because we're going to there's a deleted scene that is a version of this scene but extended we're going to talk about that more probably towards the end of this minute but now i just want to kind of highlight that scene starts with a sunset so i do think part that's kind of one more reason we have that is we go from the New Mexico sunset to the Asgardian sunset. And I'm sure that we're going to do some really nice kind of dissolve or something like that from one to the other. Yeah, this this set is very theatrical. 
Um, and, and the fact that, you know, gen- generally, I think Kenneth Branagh shoots the scene kind of like in like a three, three walled sort of scenario where the camera is the fourth wall. Um, he doesn't really break that, you know, 180 line. Uh, and, and that feels very theatrical. It feels like a, a set on a stage. Um, and a lot of, a lot of the Asgardian stuff in this movie feels very theatrical in that way. I didn't, I think that's, you know, purposeful. And I think it's the reason why they probably went for Kenneth Branagh for this film. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's a really cool way to sort of, um, set Asgard apart from the earth scenes, which are, you know, mostly handheld and things like that. Uh, and then you go to Asgard and it's these big theatrical sets and these big theatrical, you know, blocking and camera movements. And, uh, I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm really into the way that he shot this movie. I know a lot of people aren't, a lot of people like to make fun of the Dutch angles, which is totally fair. There are a lot of them in this movie, but um, but I I get a kick out of it. I I, I really like yeah. the way he directed this movie, and I love the Dutch angles. I mean, as, uh, it, as somebody who I mean, I also really enjoyed the way that Ang Lee was playing around with like comic book sensibilities when he did his version of Hulk. Which I mean, it's it's a, you know it has its issues, but I, still I love that Brana here is just just shaking it up, and he's just like, why not? Let's just go crazy with Dutch angles and put them in everywhere when we can, and. I, it's just fun. It just makes it always a little different for me. So I, I enjoy it. And I love the way you describe these sets as theatrical, because I, to me, what I always think of is the kind of like 1930s, 1940s Hollywood epic, you know, Ben-Hur or El Cid or Cleopatra or things like that, where you, you know, just expect this like monumental set. And that's very much what I what I get out of it. And Bo Welch really was going for that with, with the production design. Like he really wanted to give the actors that feel of those really big sets that, I mean, you really feel like, you know, Hopkins said when he sat on the throne, he's like, I don't have to do any work because just sitting here, (laughs) I'm I'm doing the job. Yeah. So, yeah. So, and then we get, we see Odin and he's kind of surrounded by this, like, it's like a golden shield with like a whole bunch of dust light. Is this kind of like the Asgardian version of a back to tank? Like what's going on here? (laughs) <laughs> it's peculiar. I love the look of it. I've never really understood it, except it's like an Odin sleep sort of energy force. Like, is this the Odin force that he's absorbing as he does his Odin sleep here? I like to think that the way this works is because, you know, Odin is he's a king in the world of Asgard, but he's also a god. Right. And so I like to think that what is happening is that he is recharged by sort of like the prayers and faith of his followers. And that's what all of this dust is st- stuff is. It's just sort of like him absorbing that sort of religious energy of like everyone who believes in Odin and prays to Odin and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. That's it's the Tinkerbell. They've got to applaud yeah. enough for him to. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I, 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 that's kind of general. Generally, I think that's kind of what's going on, at least in my mind. Yeah. I love it. I mean, a more serious version of that is uh, for anyone who's either read or seen the TV show American Gods, that's often the idea is that gods, you know, the gods of the past become more or less powerful depending on how many people still believe in them. And so, yeah, it's kind of a fun way of seeing it. Same thing in Rise of the Guardians with the uh, all the, you know, Easter Bunny and Santa Claus. <laughs> yeah, I, I, that, is, that is a cinematic <laughs> classic that has somehow escaped me up to this point. Uh, <laughs> you've, you, you're missing out. It's great. From one of the directors great. of Spider-Verse. So that's, don't knock until you try it. That is high praise. That is one of my favorite uh, superhero movies. So I take it, though, that this uh, this thing of like the the dust magic uh this is not in the comic books correct like who knows i i mean there are a lot of thor comics i haven't read uh i haven't come across it yet it doesn't mean that they haven't explored something like this with the odin sleep which is something that they've kind of evolved with the comics so i i don't know i can't i can't speak to that but hopefully somebody can uh can let us know but it definitely seems like something that they really evolved in the film here even though it's never i struggle with it because uh, you know, Odin, you know, he they say he's needed to do this for a long time. He's been putting it off. And and our sense is that he's put it off because of the possibilities of war with the Jotuns. There are all these potential reasons. Is it because he took their baby? Is it because he didn't think Thor was ready? Yeah, he didn't think Thor was ready. All these potential reasons. 
But at the same time, it's like Loki says, I never get used to seeing him like this. But it's like, well, then when did you see that happen? Like, it, it, my sense is like nobody has seen him do this for millennia. So I like I I don't know. I, I struggle with the concept. Like, I think it's really interesting. I just I never quite know like when this actually has happened yeah. before. The, yeah. I mean, the concept of the Odin sleep in in the context of like this movie and comics it really does just sort of feel like we need to get Odin off the board and we don't want to kill him. Mm -hmm. So he go, he goes and takes a nap and you can't be disturbed. <laughs> it's just, right. it, it just feels like a way to get Odin off the board because at a certain point, you don't really have anything to do with him. It's very much a plot device, I think. And, and, yeah. Maybe not the best devised one in terms of how much sense it makes. Yeah. Yeah. Especially because like Frigga, like she's saying he's put it, uh, you know, he's put it off for so long. I fear what? Like, is he going to die? He may never wake up. Like, is a coma? Like, like they, they start exploring all these things. Like he could be in this thing for millennia, even though he's only in it for like a day. So it's, you know, I don't really, there's, ah, I don't know. It's frustrating. I, I, yeah. I think the way I read it, and this is just because I'm a European history nerd. And so I know a lot of like how these things often worked in kingdoms and stuff like that is, you know, if the heir to the throne is clearly a child and the king becomes, you know, incapacitated, then there's just a regent who becomes king, you know, maybe because the king has died until the, the heir is old enough to rule or just like till the king wakes back up or, you know, comes back from his visit over the seas. But that once the, the once the, the heir is supposed to, he is like more like, you know, at least a teenager, then you can't just have a regent. You have to give power to that heir. And so I guess my headcanon for this is that he went into this a couple of times while Thor and Loki were very young. Because again, we don't know how long, you know, their terrible twos might have lasted a thousand years. We don't know how, how that all works. Yeah, right, right. And, but by the time that like, if he was going to do it again, you know, Thor was now old enough that he would be, he would take over and Odin didn't think Thor was ready. And so that's why he kept holding it off and holding it off and holding it off until this moment. Yeah, I can buy that. That 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 actually is the one situation where it would kind of make sense, where somebody else other than Thor was kind of stepping in to rule in, in Odin's stead while he was doing this. What, one thing I think is interesting here is my sense is that nobody here except Loki knows that Loki kind of badgered him into this. Like, not not exactly, and it's not, you know, it's like you yell at someone, they have a heart attack. It's not your fault, necessarily. But certainly it was the emotional stress of what Loki was accusing him of after all the horrible things he'd gone through with his son, with, with his other son, Thor. Like, I, I don't get the sense that Frigga has any idea that it was Loki yelling at Odin that that kind of was the last straw is that that kind of how you all feel well i mean theoretically there were a couple guards who might have heard some of what was happening from behind the door but again it boils down to like who are the guards talking to is the is you know is there kind of a buzz amongst some of the lower class but the royalty never hears uh, i i don't really have a, a sense but um but other other than those two guards who happen to be behind the door um i don't think Largely, anyone else would have any sense that Loki and Odin were having this big uh, battle down in the, uh, the the vault. Well, so, Andy, I know that your favorite game is the IMDb game. Uh, what is quickly becoming my favorite game with this podcast is the What is Loki Thinking game, because we can ask <laughs> it so often. And, and Scott, I'll kind of start with you. You know, we've been going back and forth a lot for this entire movie about where is Loki scheming versus when is he like just feeling genuine emotion? And wh what do you think is happening here? Because here he's in such this delicate place of, you know, he's finding out more about what his mother and father did to him. And he's hearing about his father, who he does still clearly have affection for and is in a bad way. But he's also hearing about like maybe he is going to get all this power or maybe he's not based on what happens with Thor or not. What, 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 what do you think is going on in his head? Well, I think he's he's always a character who is uh, I mean, literally in his origins, he's he's a character that is sort of like between two worlds. Right. And I think that his mind is the same way, whereas like, yeah, he's the trickster god and he's always scheming and wanting this new power. But also 
he does love his brother. He also hates his brother and he loves his family, but also he resents his family for hiding this secret from him. And and I think that <laughs> I, I I think that he's never in one spot. I think he is cursed to think about things uh think about everything from multiple perspectives simultaneously because that's how he's always sort of lived his life even before he knew the truth about his origins um so so yeah i think both of the things are true i think that he is really excited at the prospect of getting a bunch of power something that he thought he might never get because thor is his older brother but then also yeah he is genuine when he says like i never get used to seeing him like this like powerless and weak you know like a little baby and and also um you know angry at them for holding the secret but then understanding the reasons why they did it once it's explained to him you know um and so i think that he is he's a real that's what makes him such an interesting character is that he doesn't just have one angle he has so many different angles and some of them are positive and some of them are negative um and you don't know which is ruling which at any time it's really it's really fascinating like just uh, especially watching the way that um that hiddleston plays him in the scene because he does kind of uh, just the way you're describing it like where there are so many conflicting things all working at the same time like i feel like i see that here like he starts off seeming very concerned about his father and then there's like this switch like how long do you think it's going to last because it's like is he plotting and planning now like he's like how long will i be able to maintain this this kingship that i'm i've found myself in and uh and there's kind of a voice tone shift that he does there and then he kind of goes into this whole thing with his past about his dad lying and all of this and and Frigga is so loving and and the way that she talks to him it's it's great even though it's this whole thing about lying versus keeping the truth but it keeps coming back to Loki and I I feel like he feels the love but then I feel like there's another shift when she mentions your brother and this idea that Thor might return and so I love the way that we see that playing because I do feel like there are so many conflicting things that you can see uh going through Loki's head through this entire minute here Especially because, as I understand it, I think he's he's excited about the power he's going to get. But also for him, this is such a moment of validation. You know, he is the guy who or the kid who has always been in someone's shadow and has always thought, you know what? I see the real version of that person. And if only they saw that he's actually a jerk, they would see that actually I'm pretty awesome, you know? And he's getting that. Like, finally, it's, he's like, people see Thor for what Thor really is. Like, I think he does genuinely believe Thor would be a terrible king. And now he has this moment of like, mom and dad love me. They think that I could be a good king. They see that I'm the real deal. And then the mom's like, yeah, and, and don't worry, we're going to get Thor back, too. And in his head, he's like, no, no, we, we just agreed Thor is not redeemable. Stay with me here, you know? And it's, it, I can really relate to that moment, like, you know, of like, you think the high school, you think the bully in middle school is finally going to get in trouble, but the, nah, it's actually not a big deal. And you're like, but come on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I also just think that he's in a process of justifying what he's done to himself you know like that moment of like how long is he gonna is he gonna be there right and he's thinking about like the power and that and then he asks about his past and about the lying because he's trying to justify his evil sort of scheming to himself by being like well but they lied to me so it's okay yeah i'm i'm okay i'm still a good person you know deep down and so i i just i love all of the angles that this this scene is playing for loki yeah i think i think that's so true and it it goes back to andy what you said about the distinction between you lied to me versus he kept the truth from you and I, I think that that's, in a way, it very much parallels the conversation he was having with Odin, where Frigga's being much more sympathetic and much more loving. But in the same way, like, she's trying to tell him what happened, and he's only hearing the very worst parts, you know, and he's twist Like, I don't know if he's twisting. I mean, I think there was some clear lying, but it, it it's just so clear that they're not talking in the same language, just like he, he and Odin didn't. Well, and some of that also, I mean, we've talked a lot about 
uh, the way that the victors uh, sell the story, right? The whole thing that Odin, the way that he he spun the war with Jotun, the Jotuns. Um, there's also this potential version of this whole story that he sold to Frigga about why he took Loki. We don't ever really get that. We obviously are just getting the fact that she she sees Loki as her son and they love him. Um, but it does make me wonder, like, you know, what was the story that Odin, oh, that Odin told to Frigga uh, when he brought this baby back? When, and so that's probably a good way to start talking about the deleted version of the scene that, that's a lot longer because one of the first things that jumps out to me is, as we said, we have this moment of, so why did he lie? She instead says he kept the truth from you. But the deleted scene to me has a very different feel because in that she starts by saying, I asked him to be honest. So there it does feel like she's not trying to kind of redirect away from the lie. She's just explaining it because now she's starting by acknowledging he wasn't honest and he should have been. It's actually a really interesting comparison, these two scenes, to see how the editing of a scene can really kind of shift the tone. Because that one has the t the tone kind of very, very much more kind of like steps through from like one end to the other, as opposed to this, which feels like a little bit more of this dance that they're having. And it's it's also just briefer, but um, but I I like the way that 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 plays. Yeah, I think that there's an interesting element with um with kicking it off that way. Like right there, Frigga is just saying what she said from the beginning, which is kind of an interesting way to start. Yeah, I think it's true. All right. Well, there's obviously there's so much more to the scene that's going to happen. Is there anything else we want to talk about for the scene or in the deleted scene? Just got to point out, uh, once again, Odin's ravens are here. We have Hugin and Munin. Uh, each of them are on a pedestal on either side of his bed, just sitting there, uh, just kind of chilling. I, I wonder, is this, do they just do this? Like they're sitting on his, on his throne during the coronation, and here they're just sitting by his bed. I just feel like... <laughs> I feel sad for these ravens. I wish that, you know, we got to ever see them, you know, flying or anything. But it's just like, are they just now going to sit here on either side of Odin's bed for the duration of the Odin sleep? Does somebody else come and take care of them? I have no idea. Well, we're going to find out in the next minute that they're the classic story of the actor who has all their lines winds up on the cutting room floor because they do have a line in the deleted version <laughs> of the next minute, which we'll get to. So right. anyway, um, Thank you all so much, as always. This has been a great conversation. Scott, we've talked kind of about the minute-by-minute um, -minute podcasts you've done, about the franchise stuff. What other projects are you involved with or that people are going to find on your podcast network? Well, uh, speaking of characters who uh, every once in a while need to uh, go through a regenerative process, um, I'm also the host of The Doctor's Companion, which is a Doctor Who podcast. <laughs> um, and uh, we are very excited because uh, on, on Halloween, the new season of Doctor Who premieres, um, the final season of uh, Jodie Whittaker's tenure as the Doctor and uh, and Chris Chibnall as showrunner. So we're we're excited to see how all of this comes to fruition. Um, a very mixed bag of an era of the show, um, and uh, but we're we're never not excited for Doctor Who, but we're also excited for the the bittersweet moment of of regeneration where we lose a Doctor that. Feels like we just got them, um, and and gain a new doctor, which is also extremely exciting. It's 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 an emotional roller coaster that you only get as a Doctor Who fan, and uh, we're always really really excited. It's a show that I've been doing since David Tennant regenerated, um, so I've been doing it a really long time, and uh, it's a lot of fun. So during the on season, we talk about the new episodes, and in the off season, we do what we call Doctor Who the Long Way Around, where we talk about every story from every Doctor, one Doctor at a time. So we did a season of um, of like the first story of every Doctor, and then the second story of every Doctor, and so on and so forth. I think we're on the ninth or tenth season of that at this point. Um, so uh, check that out. It's The Doctor's Companion, and once again, you can get it at DuelingGenre.com or anywhere you get your podcasts. And, and I'm guessing from that, you don't mean you go back to Eccleston. You mean you're going all the way back to the cardboard Daleks oh, and all that kind yeah. of stuff. All the way back. We we start nice. with the uh, the first doctor and go all the way through to in the long way around we go all the way through to Capaldi. Um cuz you know, we'll we'll get back around to revisiting Whitaker uh in the future, but we're not quite there yet. <laughs>
<laughs> Sounds good. Well, definitely check that out. Check out all your podcasts on the Next Real Family Podcast. And of course, if you want to hear more of my podcasts, uh, the Superhero Ethics, the Star Wars Universe Podcast, uh, and some other projects I do from time to time, those are all can be found on theethicalpanda.com. So please check all those things out. And most importantly, thank you so much for being great fans. Have a great day. Until next time, true believers. Marvel Movie Minute is a production of True Story FM, engineering by Andy Nelson. This season's music is One Last Ride by Martin Puringer. Find the show at truestory.fm. And if your podcast app allows ratings and reviews, consider doing that for this show. Thank you.